प्लीज बी सीटेड गुड आफ्टरनून मिस्टर फंडापुरी वेलकम टू द कोर्ट रूम एस वी हर्ड फ्रॉम मिस्टर मिक्लोस्की इट्स नाउ योर टर्न टू प्रेजेंट द व्यूज ऑफ द प्रोसिक्यूशन यू हैव द फ्लोर थैंक यू वेरी काइंडली मिस्टर प्रेसिडेंट एंड गुड आफ्टरनून टू यू योर ऑनर्स गुड आफ्टरनून टू यू मिस्टर गाइच and to you general tolomir and everyone the honors it's my privilege to appear before you today to present part of the prosecution's closing submissions in this very serious and obviously historically important case as the chamber is aware the accused is charged with responsibility for the crimes alleged in the indictment under article 71 of the tribunal statute and under each mode of liability including joint criminal enterprise in his closing brief aside from basically acknowledging his position as the VRS main staff assistant commander for security and intelligence during the war general tolomir has acknowledged little else he has challenged essentially every material aspect of this case including the crime based evidence ranging from the number of Srebrenica dead and missing to the very nature of the Muslim population's removal from the Srebrenica and Jeppa enclaves. It is clearly General Tolomir's right to put the prosecution to proof, and of course we recognize and accept that the burden of proof in this case is ours alone. We are nevertheless confident that on the record of these proceedings general tolomir's involvement and guilt in the horrendous and unspeakable crimes charged in the indictment is proved beyond any reasonable doubt except to underscore and highlight some of the core issues establishing general tolomir's individual criminal responsibility and to respond to specific assertions that are made in the defense closing brief i will to the greatest extent possible try to refrain from restating matters that are extensively addressed in the prosecution's final brief instead i'll focus on two salient aspects of general tolomir's responsibility first following on from my colleague mr mcclosky's submissions i'll address the facts and circumstances proving general tolomir's significant contributions to the murder jce by means of his omissions second i'll address the key facts proving the JCE to forcibly transfer the Muslim populations of Srebrenica and Jeppa and General Tolomir's full participation in it. General Tolomir's failure to protect the Muslim prisoners in VRS custody following Srebrenica's fall was a serious violation of international law and there's no question about that. On the evidence in this case, the fact of his failure is not complicated nor is it particularly nuanced to the contrary it is stark it is glaring it is unassailable and it is undeniable general tolomir's omissions were no less a significant contribution to the jce to murder the men and boys of srebrenica than his positive conduct which you've just heard about like his positive actions the omissions were the product of a conscious choice and demonstrate his commitment to achieving the criminal objectives of the JCE and for this reason they too give rise to his responsibility under article 71 of the tribunal statute to be clear indictment paragraph 29d alleges general tolomir's responsibility for failing to protect the muslim prisoners and it provides specifically that he had responsibility for the handling of all of the of the Bosnian Muslim prisoners taken after the fall of the Srebrenica enclave and to ensure their safety and welfare and he failed to do so the honors the evidence in this case bears this out first general tolomir had a duty under customary international law to ensure the humane treatment and protection of the muslim prisoners in vrs custody especially those within the custody of the organs units and officers over which or whom 
General Tolomir exercised control. As explained in the prosecution's closing brief under the Geneva Convention 3, all agents of a detaining power, in this case the Republic of Srpska, having custody of prisoners, have a duty to ensure their humane treatment. And that duty applies to individuals, including those with direct custody of prisoners and those individuals who supervise them. Given his position, there is no question that General Tolomir was an agent of the detaining power. He was a member of the VRS, of the main staff of the VRS, and the duty to protect applied to him. Second, and equally clear, Tolomir supervised many of the officers in whose custody the Muslim men and boys taken prisoner following the collapse of the enclave, and Srebrenica enclave, and then later Jepa found themselves. These officers included Lubisha Bayara, Colonel, Chief of the Security Administration of the Main Staff. Dragomir Pachanitz, who I'm sure you remember, was an intelligence officer within General Tolomir's sector. Vujadin Popovich, who my colleague has just referred to as the Chief of Security of the Drina Corps. Momir Nikolic, the Chief of Intelligence and Security of the Bratunats Brigade. Drago Nikolic, the Chief of Security of the Zvornik Brigade. Milorad Turbic, another security officer, and Drago Nikolic's assistant in the Zvornik Brigade. Zaron Charkic, as well as Bratunats Brigade MPs, including Mirko Jankovic. Zvornik Brigade MPs, including Milmir Yasikovats. And that's just to name a few. That General Tolomir commanded, and I say this in quotes, commanded Lubisha Bayara, his immediate subordinate within the security and intelligence sector, who was a key figure in the planning and implementation of the murder operation, is amply established by the evidence in this case. And it is not in doubt that General Tolomir maintained professional control over the VRS military police and the subordinate security organs, which included officers having custody over the Muslim prisoners. It was General Tolomir's sector that was responsible for the training and equipping and guiding subordinate security organs, sabotage units, including the 10th Sabotage Unit and the military police within the VRS. And indeed, it was his sector that was responsible for dealing with prisoner issues, such as their interrogation and their securing. <coughs> the legality and correctness of the work of the subordinate security officers and organs were General Tolomir's exclusive responsibility. And you'll find that in P1112, page three, item seven. A number of documents and evidence further establish General Tolomir's active exercise of authority over subordinate security organs, personnel, and the military police. These documents show, for instance, his issuance of assignments and orders. An example is P2430, and that's a main staff uh, document where he reports on the combat readiness and issues assignments to the 65th Regiment Protection Military Police. There's another document, which is P2141, in which he is enforcing a prior order for subordinate units to submit names so that the main staff can establish the 10th Sabotage Detachment and other documents such as the promulgation and dissemination of rules and guidelines, in particular concerning the treatment of prisoners. An example of that is P1970. Remember, Ptolemy's security and intelligence subordinates and the military police were directly engaged in the events in Potichari, in Bratunats, in Zvornik, and in fact, they were involved in every single phase of the murder operation. They had, without question, custody and control over the prisoners at every stage. They detained them, 
They secured them, they questioned them, they transported them, and in the end, they were the ultimate instrumentality of their extermination. Interpreters note, could the council please slow down a bit? Thank you. Mr. Van der Poel, you heard the comment. I'll please slow down a bit. I'll do, Mr. President. There is no real contest about whether General Tolomir was under a duty to protect the Muslim prisoners, particularly as one in a supervisory position over the VRS officers and units in whose custody the prisoners were. Similarly, General Tolomir's knowledge of the VRS custody of these prisoners is not an issue. You'll recall, and I believe my colleague has just reminded the chamber, of a 12 July document in which General Tolomir is directing that fleeing Muslims be arrested and be detained. You recall the document that my colleague referred to, I think it was P122, 13 July document, referring to the 1,000 prisoners in Dushanova Kassaba. Uh, may I interrupt you again? It's very difficult to listen uh, when we hear the sound of typing at the same time because of the, it's from the same table. Please continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Aside from the document, which the defense has disputed in their brief, the testimony and the evidence of General Savcic, who was with General Tolomir on 13 July in the morning, establishes that General Tolomir was put on notice of the numbers of prisoners that were surrendering in Dushanova Kassaba through a telephone call or a series of telephone calls that General Savcic received from Zoran Malinic, the head of the 65th Protection Military Police Battalion. Further evidence of General Tolomir's knowledge of the numbers of prisoners can be found in the 13 July document that he issued on the evening of 13 July requesting or proposing that 800 prisoners be sent down to the Siemic farm in Rogatica. He also communicated with Milenko Todorovic, the chief of security of the East Bosnia Corps advising him to prepare, or take steps to prepare the Batkovic prison camp to receive 1,000 to 1,300 prisoners. He knew that there were thousands of prisoners by 13 July in VRS hands. And he knew that they were going to be killed. Leaving aside the ample evidence of his direct involvement in the planning and implementation of these executions, as my colleague has just detailed, the evidence in this case leaves no room for the defense's fanciful suggestion that General Tolomir could not reasonably foresee the prisoner's exposure to grave harm in VRS custody and at any point during the 10-day period over which they were slaughtered. I say again the 10-day period because we start on the 13th of July by the Yadar River and we end up on the 23rd of July in Vishina. And in that time, some 7,000 individuals were summar summarily executed with the involvement of the security and intelligence sector and their subordinates. Given the pervasive and sustained involvement of the security administration in perpetrating these crimes, Nothing short of an army-wide and, in fact, nationwide conspiracy to hide this information from General Tolomir could support his claimed ignorance of the grossly criminal acts and conduct of his immediate and professional subordinates throughout this unmitigated bloodletting. The serious mistreatment of Muslim prisoners in the VRS custody was rampant and it was known. The chamber will recall the evidence of the opportunistic killings in Bratunats and in Podachari. You saw the video footage of the Kravitsa warehouse 
from 13 July, with bodies strewn all over the ground there. The executions that happened, those executions rather, happened within hours of General Tolomir sending his proposal to send 800 prisoners down to Rogatitsa. On 14 July, bodies were being buried at Glogova, as arranged by Tolomir's immediate subordinate, Lubisha Bayara. That day, Bayara and Popovich and Nikolic, all three security officers, together with the military police, organized and transported thousands of Muslim prisoners to the Zvornik area, implementing their plan uh, to exterminate. You heard from Tanats Kutanic. He was a member of the Zvornik Brigade Command, and he told you that the numbers, that the murders, rather, up at the Kozluk on the 15th could be seen from across the Drina River. He also made this key observation, and it's rather astute in its frankness. He says, these killings were taking place in populated areas. People saw this. People had phones. The VRS had phones, too. They had radios, they had teleprinters, they had couriers. This didn't happen in the Stone Age. It happened in 1995. And the suggestion that the highest intelligence offer, officer in the main staff of the VRS and the highest organ of the VRS was in the dark because he wasn't physically at the locations where these crimes occurred at the locations where his colleagues were perpetrating these crimes, crimes committed on an unprecedented scale, on an arrestive scale in this war, insults the intelligence. These were crimes that involved his very subordinates from the battalion level to the brigade level to the corps level and to the main staff level virtually every level of the VRS organizational structure under his direction. These are crimes that could easily have jeopardized the Bosnian-Serb war effort, and they did. And they were crimes of a scale, as I say, in many ways unparalleled throughout the war. What the evidence proves in this case, Your Honors, beyond any reasonable doubt, is that with knowledge that thousands of Muslim men and boys were in VRS custody, with knowledge that they were to be harmed, at least harmed gravely, and in this case, murdered, and with knowledge that his own subordinates and others were directly and actively involved in planning, organizing, and executing their deaths in the most brutal and systematic, sustained, and callous way. Ptolemyr failed absolutely to ensure their protection. These omissions directly and at least significantly contributed to the success of the murder operation. It ensured its successful planning, it ensured its successful organization, and it ensured that it could be carried out unimpeded and, in fact, professionally implemented and run by members of the security and intelligence sector, of which General Tolomir was conceitedly in charge. Tolomir had the material ability to act to protect these prisoners. He was one of General Mladic's most trusted assistant commanders. He was part of General Mladic's inner core, as he put it. Not only as a senior officer and as a general, but as a security official, General Tolomir had a specific obligation under the VRS military rules, and these are rules of security service, and the constitution and laws of the Republic of Serbs Republic Republika Srpska. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because a lot of this is covered in the brief. But in essence, the rules of service for security officers Applied, to VR, applied in the VRS and required General Tolomir to detect and prevent acts committed within the VRS as well as those outside of it. I stress within the VRS because 
These are the circumstances of this case. He was required to act in that way with respect to any act carried out in the VRS which subverted the constitutional order, which is described in evidence in this case, and you have it in this case, and concerns the guarantee of and protection of human freedom and rights with respect to international standards. That's what it says in Article 5. It ostensibly assured national equality and protected the rights of ethnic groups, including Muslims. It ostensibly provided for the inviolability of life and the protection from cruel and inhuman treatment. His job, his core competency, was to prevent the violation of those guarantees. In that capacity, his responsibilities required him under VRS rules, not international rules, VRS rules, for him to discover, prevent, report, arrest, and investigate the perpetrators and the accomplices of crimes against humanity and international law including those committed within the VRS, precisely the types of crimes that are alleged here. So the question is, what would have happened if General Tolomir had done any of this before or during the course of the murder operation? What would have happened if General Tolomir decided to act to actually protect the prisoners? If he took an action to arrest the planners of these crimes, or the organizers of these crimes, or the perpetrators of these crimes, if he investigated the issues, if he reported them, if he withdrew members of his sector and subordinates from participating in the plan. I think the answer is pretty clear, and that is there's no way that these murders could have occurred and certainly not on the scale in which they were perpetrated. General Ptolemyer chose not to take an action for one reason and one reason only, and that is because he was a part of it and because he intended to bring about the objectives of the joint criminal enterprise to murder the Muslim men and boys of Srebrenica. It was his intention through his omission to ensure that the murder operation was carried out efficiently. It was his intention to ensure that the murder operation was carried out undetected. It was his intention to simply make it happen, to implement the commander's orders like he's supposed to do as an assistant commander. And he did. As a career JNA officer, General Ptolemyer knew perfectly well that he had an obligation to ensure the humane treatment of prisoners, and this was not only as a result of his training, but also because that duty was specifically codified in various Army regulations. I will refer the Chamber to P2482, Article 210, which says, prisoners of war shall be treated humanely in particular, they must be protected against violence, insults, and intimidation. Those are from the SFRY regulations on the application of rules of international war or international law of war. Protection from murder goes without saying. On the evidence of this case, the fact that the members, that the murders rather, of thousands of prisoners in VRS custody were planned, organized, and successfully implemented by members of the VRS main staff and VRS officers immediately proximate to the accused, whether his subordinates or not, and that General Ptolemyer chose not to take any action to protect those prisoners in accordance with his responsibilities under the VRS rules, the RS rules, the RS Constitution and international law all speak to his intent to achieve the objectives of those crimes. 
Keep in mind that given his longstanding involvement in prisoner exchange issues, his failure to act disregarded the VRS's own vested interests because it deprived them of the ability to use these prisoners for the purposes of exchange and for the purposes of extracting crucial and important intelligence information. As plain as day, the evidence in this case proves that General Ptolemy's failure to act was deliberate, it was intentional, and can only have been calculated to further the criminal objectives of the murder JC. They did that, and he should be held fully to account for it. I'd like to turn your attention, if I could, to the forcible transfer JC. Notwithstanding the defense's refusal to acknowledge that there was a JCE to forcibly remove the Muslim populations of Srebrenica and Jeppa, the fact of its existence is proven beyond any reasonable doubt in this case. Proof of General Ptolemy's unrelenting and substantial participation and contribution to this JCE is as clear as it is overwhelming. While the indictment alleges that the forcible transfer JCE began in March 1995, the underlying policy of the RS and VRS leadership to rid, the Eastern, rid Eastern Bosnia of its Muslim inhabitants was in place much earlier, beginning with the implementation of the six strategic objectives. Other compelling evidence in this case establishes the criminal aims of the RS and VRS leadership to ethnically cleanse Serb-claimed territory in Bosnia and Herzegovina, including the Eastern enclaves. Remarkably, the defense argues that the six strategic objectives were put forward, and I quote, as a kind of action plan. This is at paragraph 371 of the defense closing brief. The evidence in this case, of course, proves that at the 16th session of the RS National Assembly on 12 May 1992, these objectives were laid out, they were discussed, and they were fully embraced. Although their publication in a Gazette in 1993 is anomalous, it is clear from the number that is assigned to the, publica to the publication, which is 02-130-92 that the decision was taken in 1992, consistent with the declaration itself, which attributes that to the 12th May 1992 assembly session. In any event, these war goals were clearly disseminated and implemented by the VRS. In his evidence, General Novica Simic was the commander of the East Bosnia Corps, recounted his 2nd September meeting in 1992 with Generals Mladic, Guevara, and Presidents Karadzic and Krajnik, President of the RS National Assembly. At that meeting, the strategic objectives were discussed. And he wrote them down in his war diary. You have that evidence before you. You have his testimony at P. 2756, and you have the diary at P2752. The VRS main staff's 1992 analysis of combat readiness, which is P2880, also refers expressly to the implementation of the, of the strategic objectives. It talks about their progress. And this exposes, of course, the fallacy of the defense's arguments. The 1992 combat report states in part, quote, the strategic objectives of our war, which were promptly defined and set before the main staff of the Army of Republika Srpska, the commands and units, served as a general guideline upon which we planned the actual operations and concerted battles, end quote. You'll find that in that exhibit, 2880 at page 159. 
The defense's assertions concerning the circumstances under which the strategic objectives were decided fundamentally amount to nothing more than an unfortunate attempt to distract from the real issues in this case, those issues which unmistakably underpin General Tolomir's criminal responsibility for the forcible transfer of tens of thousands of Bosnian Muslims in 1995. As noted in the prosecution's brief, strategic objectives one and three culminated in the forcible transfer of the Muslim populations of Srebrenica and Zhapa. Strategic objective one called for, and I quote, to establish state borders separating the Serbian people from the other two ethnic communities. As General Simic noted down in his diary, in shorthand, quote, separation from the Muslims. Strategic objective number three, quote, the elimination of the Drina River, River as a border between Serb states. This was implemented so as to remove the Muslim presence in eastern Bosnia. Again, General Simic wrote this down in quotes, Drina River Valley to Serbs. The 16th assembly session minutes confirm that interpretation and say that the belt along the Drina must basically belong to the Serbs. In addition, recall that operational directives issued at the main staff level were also implemented, and in particular, Directive 4. That was issued on the 19th of November, 1992, and was an important step in the realization of strategic objective number three. Directive 4 expressed the RS leadership's policy of ethnic cleansing. It put it in motion. And this policy was pursued by the VRS in eastern Bosnia right through 1995. General Tolomir and the security and intelligence sector under his command had to have been vo involved in developing this directive, which required the expertise and input of each assistant commander. Directive 4 ordered the Drina Corps to, quote, force him, meaning the military, Bosnian Muslim military, to leave the Birach, Zhepa, and Gorazda areas together with the Muslim population. Birach, of course, included Srebrenica. Given the gravity and the manifest implications of this language, it hardly comes as a surprise that a number of VRS officers have tried to explain it away. However, the candid evidence of Colonel Milenko Lazic, who was a Drina Corps operations and training officer who worked in the main staff from 1992 to 1993, puts things in perspective. Asked whether an objective of the VRS was to separate the peoples of Bosnia and Herzegovina by their ethnicity, he said this. You'll find this, at, by the way, at P2733. Transcript lines are 21833, basically through 21835. He says, I think that the main objective of the VRS was to defend the Serb population from the attacks coming from the other side. And if there was no other solution available, then to separate us on ethnic principles. And I believe that that was the understanding of every individual member of the VRS. If there was any ambiguity in Directive 4's language, Milenko Zhivanovich, the commander of the Drina Corps, the one responsible for implementing the tasks assigned to the Drina Corps under the directive makes things even clearer. In issuing order 212, rather, dash 126 on 24 November 1992, implementing the tasks of directive number four, he ordered, inflict 
on the enemy the highest possible losses, exhaust them, break them up, or force them to surrender. And I'll add this significantly and, ambiguous, and unambiguously. He says, force the Muslim local population to abandon the area of Sirska, Zepa, Gorazda, I'm sorry, Zep, Zepa, Srebrenica, and Gorazda. Confronted with this language, you will remember the defense so-called military expert. His explanation was, I honestly don't know why Zhivanovich put this sentence in this order, in this manner. I would submit to the chamber that there is one very obvious explanation, and that is that the language reflects precisely what General, at the time, Colonel Zhivanovich meant, and it reflects precisely what Directive 4 really called for, the separation along ethnic lines. On 4 July 1994, we see the Bratunath Brigade's then commander, Slavko Ogenyenovich. He issued a report following General Mladic's briefing regarding uh, the core combat readiness. In his report, Ogenyenovich says, we must attain our final goal, an entirely Serbian, Serbian podrinje, the enclaves of Srebrenica, Zepa, and Gorazde must be defeated militarily. We must continue to arm, train, discipline, and prepare the RS Army for the execution of this crucial task, the expulsion of Muslims from the Srebrenica enclave. There will be no retreat when it comes to the Srebrenica enclave. We must advance. The enemy's life has to be, has to be made unbearable and their temporary stay in the enclave impossible so that they leave the enclave en masse as soon as possible, realizing that they cannot survive there. If the language about making life unbearable and not surviving together with the rubric of disappearing and vanishing sounds familiar to the chamber, it's because it is. And you've heard it countless times in the evidence of this case like a mantra. For instance, in August 1994, and this is at P2228, it's a videotaped conversation with General Mladic and Milan Lesic, who you recall was a uh, Canadian supporter of the VRS and donor. As Mladic and Lesic are in the car driving towards the Zepa enclave, you'll recall, Mladic says bluntly this. Here, you see, the Turks had blocked up all this. Here's the road to their village of Gojenye. Here's the village of Plane. It used to be Turkish. Now we will go towards it. <coughs> you film this freely, you know. Let our Serbs see what we've done to them, how we took care of the Turks. In Podrinje, we thrashed the Turks. If the Americans and English, the Ukrainians and the Canadians and Srebrenica in the meantime, it's the Dutch would not protect them. They would have disappeared from this area long ago. Significantly in March 1995, seven months later, the Supreme Commander, JCE member, Radovan Karadzic issued directive number seven. And again, we hear the mantra, make the Muslims' lives unbearable, drive them out. In assigning task to the Drina Corps, Directive 7 says, by planned and well thought out combat operations, create an unbearable situation of total insecurity with no hope of further survival or life for the inhabitants of Srebrenica and Zepa. And we're not talking about the army here. We're talking about regular people. And we're talking about the whole of the Muslim population. The directive continues and says that relevant state and military organs responsible for the work, for work rather, with unperfor and humanitarian organizations shall, through the planned and unobtrusively restrictive issuing of permits, reduce and limit the logistic support 
of unperfor to the enclaves, and the supply of material resources to the Muslim population, making them dependent on our goodwill, while at the same time avoiding condemnation by the international community and international public opinion. Astonishingly, or really perhaps not so astonishingly, the defense claims that Directive 7 was never implemented. They cite the fact that humanitarian aid convoys continued to come into the enclaves in support of this. However, indeed, that was the point. The point was to strangle the enclaves, allowing only so much in as would avoid international condemnation, while at the same time bringing the populations in the enclaves to the breaking point. Obviously, a complete cessation of aid into the enclaves would have assured international condemnation. It would have brought immediate action, and it would have defeated the directive's objective and exposed the pernicious plan behind it. In the end, I suppose the defense is left with no choice but to deny Directive 7's implementation because it is nefarious, and that's clear on its face, and because the main staff had a direct involvement in its drafting, development, and implementation, of which General Tolomir and his sector would have been a part. That this would only crystallize the main staff and General Ptolemy's participation in the realization of the criminal objectives of Directive 7. Again, Drina Corps Commander Milenko Zhivanovic dispels the defense's vacuous contention that, def that Directive 7 was in fact replaced or superseded by Directive 7-1 issued by General Mudge. In the Krivaya 1995 attack order, General Zhivanovich specifically noted, and this is, by the way, P1202, he specifically noted that it was issued, quote, pursuant to operations directive number seven and seven slash one of the main staff of the VRS. He took on the task of splitting apart the enclaves of Srebrenica and Zepa, and then reducing them to their urban areas. Obviously, the reduction of the enclaves to their urban areas would all but guarantee a humanitarian disaster, forcing the surrounding civilian population into the concentrated urban areas of Srebrenica and Zepa would clearly have made life for the Muslim population unbearable, and it did. Let me add that this order was not a secret. It was copied to the main staff and it was specifically approved by General Mladic. You'll see his signature recorded on the attack map and his approval of it. Given General Ptolemy's crucial importance to Mladic and the main staff's decision making and his involvement in the development of Directive 7, Ptolemy was fully informed of Krivaya 1995, including the operations. I'll take talk about that a little bit more specifically in just a few minutes. There is no plausible debate about whether Directive 7 was in fact implemented on the evidence of this case. The evidence proves that it was carried out, in fact, in its terms, as calculated to create the conditions to force the Muslim population from Srebrenica and Jeppa, which, contrary to the defense position at paragraph 411 of their brief, the Bosnian Serb leadership clearly viewed as strategic. President Karadzic's speech at the 53rd National Assembly on 28 August 1995 crystallizes this issue. And he says this, we absolutely cannot let ourselves get any ideas about them taking our traditional territories from us. To tell you the truth, there are towns that we have grabbed for ourselves and there are only 30% of us. I can name as many of those as you want, but we cannot give up the towns where we made up 70%. Don't let this get around 
But remember how many of us there were in Bratunac, how many in Srebrenica, how many in Visegrad, how many in Rogatica, how many in Vlasenica, in Zvornik, etc. Due to strategic importance, they had to become ours, and no one is practically questioning it anymore. Ptolemyr was in attendance at this assembly session, and he even addressed the assembly. You have that in evidence at P2435. That there was a joint criminal enterprise to remove by force the Muslim populations of Srebrenica and Jeppa is as certain in this case as the resultant crimes that you've seen. The defense seems to argue, in essence, that the populations of Jeppa and Srebrenica were not forcibly removed, but they left the enclave rather on their own accord or pursuant to an agreement. The evidence in this, in this case presides, uh, presents precisely the opposite conclusion. I'll not go into that much detail here either because I think it's quite well addressed in the, in the prosecution's closing brief. But the trial record is replete with evidence establishing that there was a forcible transfer and deportation of the Muslims in Srebrenica and Jeppa, as well as the foreseeable crimes that, er that occurred. I'm sure that the chamber recalls the ample evidence of the shelling of civilian targets in the lead up to the attack on Srebrenica. You've heard from UNMOs, you've heard from victims, survivors, you've heard from other internationals such as Dutch Bat. You will recall, I'm sure, the terror attack that was carried out by the 10th Sabotage Detachment on 23 June 1995 the evidence of the relentless destruction of humanitarian, a uh, restriction rather, of humanitarian convoys into the enclaves, the evidence of starvation and desperation within the Srebrenica population prior to the enclave's collapse, the fear and desperation of the Muslim population fleeing Srebrenica into Podachari from their homes and nearby villages as they were terrorized by Bosnian Serb forces. The deplorable and deteriorating conditions in Podachari, which the crowd endured, a crowd of more than 20,000, 30,000 Muslim refugees, they endured for days prior to their expulsion from the enclaves. During that time, on top of it, they were subjected to sniping attacks by BRS units. You'll find that evidence in P598, transcript lines 2440 through 41, and transcript page 2486. I'm certain that the chamber has not forgotten the video footage showing the despair and the fear on the faces of the women and children and the men, the husbands, the brothers, the fathers, that were systematically torn away from as their families were loaded onto waiting vehicles and kicked out of their homes. The chamber, I'm sure, will recall the video footage of the events in Jeppa, where a virtual repeat of these events took place, where the population was shelled and forced into the hills and then forced back into the town and booted out on trucks and on buses, shipped off to Muslim-held areas. Or they were forced to flee on foot into Serbia, into the hands of the Serbian MOOP in order to seek protection while Colonel Bayara was arranging for them to be shot at as they crossed the Drina River in rafts, makeshift rafts. And you'll see that in the evidence, in the intercept evidence in this case, from August 2nd. The suggestion, as the defense has advanced in this trial, that the populations of Srebrenica and Jeppa left the enclaves on their own accord flies in the face of history 
It flies in the face of reason. And it flies in the face of the overwhelming evidence, the overwhelming credible evidence in this case. Remember General Mladic's monologue at the Hotel Fontana when he said to Nezib Mandzic, a school teacher who was selected to meet with Mladic about the status of Muslim refugees in Potichari. At, and this is exhibit P1008, which is the prosecution's trial video. He says to Nezib Mandzic, have I made myself clear, Nezib, the future of your people is in your hands, not only in this territory. And he says, I'm finished. Bring the people who can secure the surrender of weapons and save your people from destruction. He says, I need to have a clear position of the representatives of your people on whether you want to survive, stay, or vanish. You'll find this in P1008 transcript references for page rather 47 through 48. Before General Mladic had his answer, because they adjourned that meeting till the next day, 10 a.m., 12 July, before he had his answer about whether or not that Muslim population wanted to stay, to survive, or to vanish, those buses were already rolling. Before the 10 a.m. meeting on the 12th, when he repeated the mantra, and he says, as I told this gentleman last night, you can survive or you can disappear. Those buses were already on the ground rolling. They were already on their way to take those Muslims out of that enclave. At 1250, on the 12th of July, General Mladic was intercepted saying this, they've all capitulated and surrendered and we'll evacuate them all, those who want to and those who don't want to. General Tolomir was one of Mladic's closest advisors. He was in the inner core, as General Mladic said. He was part of the decision-making process of the main staff and he was involved and active in it. Is there really any doubt that he knew what the plan was? Here's what he says on the 13th of July. This is General Tolomir. We know that he's assigned to oversee the situation as Jepa is one of the main staff generals. And he reported the ultimatum that he delivered to the Jepa Muslims. He said, we made a condition that all necessary consultations be completed by 1,500 hours and that the, quote, evacuation had to start at that time. We have conditioned this with alternative solution, with an alternative solution, military force. Hamdi Atorlak, who you heard from, recalled it this way. He says, transcript line 4292, or rather page 4292. General Tolomir told us something along these lines. Srebrenica has fallen and now it's Jeppa's turn. We can go about it two ways. What I'm offering you, offering, is for all of you, meaning the entire Muslim population, to leave Jeppa, to be, quote, evacuated, get on the buses and leave. Then he said there was nothing else to talk about. There was no negotiation. There was no agreement. And even if there were, the tribunal's case law is clear in that that would not constitute a defense because whether or not somebody is forcibly transferred is something that has to be evaluated on an individual basis. Some government representative can't go in there and agree for someone else to be transferred. And our law is clear on this issue. There was no legitimate evacuation of the population, either of Srebrenica and Jeppa. There was no combat going on, and there was no need for those people to be evacuated. In fact, the law is clear that you cannot create the condition of exigency and then turn around and rely on it as a basis to commit another act. You can't create the crisis and then claim the crisis is the excuse to remove the population. That's clear, too. 
You've heard evidence about the so-called 17 July Declaration concerning the removal of the Muslim population, the one that was signed. It was signed by Franken, it was signed by Manjic, and it was signed by Yankovic, who, who you've heard, of course, is General Ptolemy's subordinate. In that declaration, it claims, quote, no incidents were provoked by any side during the evacuation, and the Serbian side observed all the regulations of the Geneva Conventions and the international law of war. You'll recall the testimony of Dutch bad officer Robert Franken, who explained to you how this was pure and quote, end quote, nonsense. He explained that he signed the declaration with the reservation as concerns the UN observation or escort of vehicles or people from the enclave. He said he signed it because Yankovic, General Tolomir's subordinate, represented to him, or certainly gave him the impression, that it was a condition in order to get the wounded or evacuate the wounded. You'll also recall the testimony of PW 71 with respect to this declaration. The evidence concerning the 24 July agreement on disarmament uh, of the able-bodied population in Jeppa was no different. You heard Hamdiya Torlak, who told you unequivocally, quote, as far as our choices went, well, we didn't have any. Umper 4 Commander General Smith assessed the situation like this. Let me be quite clear, he said. The situation that the people wished to be evacuated from resulted from the collapse of the defense of the enclave and the presence of, Bosnian Serb, of the Bosnian Serb army amongst them. It was reported to me that you, meaning General Tolomir, amongst others, were in Jeppa, that you and others were armed, and that you were telling the population to leave. This is a transcript page 11670. Edward Joseph testified in this case, and he talked about speaking with the victims during the events. And he was told, this is it, Exhibit P1949, transcript line 14184. He was told this. He asked whether somebody was leaving, why the people were leaving. And he was told, no, I'm not leaving on my own free will. I want to stay, but who will protect me? Someone else told him there is, quote, very ample, or rather he testified that there was very ample, and it was very ample and evident to us that, that these women were going out and leaving their homes under duress. General Ptolemyr was a key participant in the forcible transfer JCE, and the evidence overwhelmingly proves that his contributions were not just at least significant, but they were substantial. Ptolemyr contributed personally and through the use of his sector and personnel to the VRS's relentless and ruthless implementation of Directive 7's plan to bring the enclaves to their knees, to make life intolerable for the Muslim inhabitants, and ultimately to drive them out. The VRS engaged in terror attacks against Srebrenica, which Tolomir's sector played a vital part. I mentioned earlier the 23 June 1995 uh, uh, attack on the enclave. Ptolemy's subordinates planned that operation. As my colleague mentioned, Colonel Salapura was involved in that planning. Vujadin Popovic was involved in that planning. Pavle Golic, an intelligence officer with the Drina Corps, he was involved in that planning too, together with 10th Sabotage Detachment Commander Milorad Palemish. Colonel Salapura testified that he didn't believe that General Ptolemy was around at the time. Because had he been, he said, General Mladic's order to engage the 10th Sabotage Unit in the operation would have been passed from General Mladic via General Tolomir to Colonel Salapura. 
Unfortunately, that testimony was not as helpful to General Tolomir as Colonel Salapara probably hoped. Because as it turns out, General Tolomir was around on 23 June 1995. President Karadzic's appointment diary puts him at a meeting with Mladic, Petar Skirbic, who of course you've heard from, and Karadzic at Pale, some 40 kilometers from Cernarieka at 1345 to 1500 hours on 23 July. You'll find that at P2198. The ERN reference there would be the ERN ending 5399. He's also caught in an intercepted communication together with General Mladic. That intercept, contrary to the defense's challenge to the reliability, the accuracy, and the authenticity of the intercept collection, is on tape. And you've got it. It's P779. Indeed, it would have been General Tolomir to approve of Colonel Salapra's proposal to use the 10th Sabotage Unit in that attack. And it would have been General Tolomir who passed on General Mladic's approval or the order implementing the engagement of that unit. General Tolomir was a major player in the VRS's restriction of the humanitarian aid convoys and also the military convoys. You'll no doubt recall seeing his signature and initials all over convoy requests and related documents. General Mladic consulted with General Tolomir and General Guerrero on these important issues. You'll recall the testimony of numerous prosecution witnesses who described the humanitarian conditions inside Srebrenica and Zepa, the effect of the restrictions of these convoys from survivors to internationals. I won't go into that. These are all set out in the prosecution's brief. You remember the testimony of Slavko Kral, the VRS main staff colonel, who initially sought to minimize General Tolomir's role in dealing with convoy issues. He had to concede when confronted with his prior testimony that General Tolomir indeed had the authority to approve convoys second to General Milovanovic. Colonel Kral testified that General Tolomir was, quote, best versed of all the main staff generals in respect of the procedures to be implemented regarding convoys. And as much as he tried to tone down General Tolomir's involvement in this process, in the decision-making process, telltale elements of his principal involvement in this emerged. And they underscore the significance of his contributions. The main staff Civil Affairs Department, with respect to convoys, acted on information that was received from the quote unquote intelligence services to deal with convoy requests. You may recall this, and I don't expect you to, but you may recall that I confronted Colonel Kral about that reference to intelligence services. What did you mean by that? And he went round and round in circles trying to explain a way that that had anything to do with General Tolomir. Fundamentally, how could it not? General Tolomir, after all, was the top intelligence and security officer in the VRS. Anything to do with intelligence fell within his jurisdiction. Anything to do with security fell within his jurisdiction. That information that was relied on by the Civil Affairs Department, the VRS, was also furnished on a regular basis, monitoring the, uh, monitoring the aid that was going into the enclaves. So the main staff decision-making apparatus knew precisely what was going in and what wasn't going in. They knew precisely the extent to which they were cutting off the lifeline of the Muslim populations inside those enclaves. And that's the civilian population. They knew this, and they were monitoring. If you take a look at D-1 
209, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And you'll see in that document that there's evidence that they had information about how much flour and oil and salt were going into the enclaves. They had precise details about what was going in. So they knew exactly what they were doing. The result of these restrictions on Dutch bat, you've heard, and you've heard lots of evidence about what effect that had and how it rendered them utterly incapable of carrying out their mandate to defend the enclaves. Ptolemyr was a part of all of that. General Ptolemyr also played a significant role in the lead up to the attack to Srebrenica. You recall how he persistently misled and stalled and outright lied to unperformed commanders about VRS intentions going in. In a July 9 communication, General Ptolemyr tells General Kerstich, I replied to unperformed commander that I was checking the information about the situation in Srebrenica and that their forces are safe. I anticipate talking to them in 40 minutes. Send a battlefield situation report every hour so that I can communicate with UMPRFOR, which will enable you to continue to work according to plan. You'll recall the evidence of General Nikolai and others who dealt with General Tolomir as this plan was being executed. Remember that it was General Tolomir who passed on the 9 July approval of President Karadzic for the VRS to go into Srebrenica and take the town, which precipitated its fall on 11 July 1995 and the further displacement of thousands of Muslims. I would also like to remind the chamber that throughout the meetings at the Hotel Fontana and the expulsion of the Muslim population from Potichari on 12 and 13 July, Ptolemy's subordinates were on the ground and they were engaged. His immediate subordinates were there, his professional subordinates were there, and they were actively involved in the forcible transfer of the civilian population. Radoslav Kindly slow down, please. Thank you. Radoslav Yankovic was there. Vujadin Popovic was there. Momir Nikolic was there. Svetozar Kosaric was there. In addition, the Drina Corps MPs were involved, as were Bratunat's brigade MPs. He directed them and he controlled them, as he always did. Remember, Ptolemyr was, quote, exclusively responsible, end quote, for the correctness and legality for their work, and that is the work of subordinate security organs, P1112. Of course he had to be, and he was well informed of what they were doing. From 13 July on, Ptolemyr oversaw the removal of the Jepa population. As I mentioned earlier, he delivered the ultimatum to the Jepa Muslims, the threat of force, which the VRS, of course, backed up upon the Muslims' refusal to capitulate. He was directly involved in VRS efforts to neutralize Ampafor, to facilitate the takedown of the enclave. And the chamber will recall the 14 July report to the main staff and General Kerstich, in which General Ptolemyr reports on the VRS having taken full control of checkpoint two at Bokshanitsa. And he says, we plan to direct the work of other UN checkpoints through this checkpoint. He says, all checkpoints have received the task to remain at their current locations even after the VRS units have passed and to report to us on the activities of the Muslims. In charge of the operation to remove the Zeppa population, Ptolemyr personally directed the operation until the last of them, that is the population, Muslim population, had been expelled. He even personally removed men from a convoy who were then transferred to Rogatitsa prison and, tr and personally escorted the last convoy of the day on 25th July. Ptolemy's contribution to the forcible transfer operation is clear, it is palpable, and it was substantial. The intensity of that contribution is matched to no lesser extent by his intent 
to use any and all force necessary to achieve its objectives. And Mr. McCloskey referred the chamber to the 21 July proposal, the one proposing the use of chemical means. And what that document shows, Your Honors, is that General Tolomir was prepared to use whatever force and whatever means necessary to achieve the objectives to which he had been assigned to carry out, and that is the removal of the Muslim population from Jabal. There is no doubt that the intent of that document was to use that force against the civilian populations, which has been attested to by Colonel Obradovich and by General Sovchich. At paragraph 358, General Tolomir, of General Tolomir's brief, he says, and I quote, his role cannot be viewed in the context of events which took place at two not very large locations. And he's right. His role has to be viewed in terms of who he was to and in the main staff. It has to be viewed in terms of his involvement in Srebrenica and Jeppa at the strategic level, the level of conception, of planning, of organization, and of execution. It has to be viewed in the context of his favored and influential position as a trusted member of General Mladic's inner core. And it has to be viewed in the context of his recognition and respect among the political leadership of the Republika Srpska. Viewed in this context, there is no doubt that he knew as well as anyone what the long-term goals were. He knew as well as anyone what the policies were. And he knew as well as anyone how the RS leadership and the VRS intended to reach those goals. He had to know in order to do his job. And he had to know to be able to counsel and ably advise General Mladic. And he had to know in order to ensure the security of VRS operations. But the evidence in this case is much more than about what he knew. It's also about what he did and what he failed to do and what he intended. The evidence in this case proves all of this. Tolomir was as invested as General Mladic, Radovan Karadzic, Vojden Popovich, Lubisha Bayara, Kerstic, and others in achieving the Bosnian-Serb war goals through manifestly criminal means. Tolomir was a key to the decision-making process of the VRS main staff. He personally participated and contributed to the forcible transfer. He oversaw and controlled his sector's involvement and the involvement of his subordinates, both immediate and professional, in the operation and in planning and implementing the conditions that brought misery and suffering to thousands of Bosnian Muslims. Your Honor, General Tolomir needs to be held to account for what he's done. Thank you for your indulgence. That concludes my submissions. Thank you very much, Mr. Van der Poel. Um, there are 15 minutes left. Um, I see that Mr. Elder King has already entered the courtroom. Um, would it be a wise proposal to have the second break now and that you, Mr. Elder King, uh, resume the last part of the session today with your submission? Good afternoon. Mr. President, your honours, I think that would be preferable. I have around half an hour, as does uh, Ms. Hassan, and I think my presentation would be cut in half if we took the break at the usual time. Then we um, uh, adjourn now for the second break, and um, uh, I think you and Ms. Hassan should be aware of the wish of Mr. McCloskey to have 10 minutes left at the end of today's hearing.